here can see. If you can't, there's lots of room over here. So don't hesitate to, to move. It won't bother me. It might bother other people, but it won't, <laughs> won't bother me. Uh, this is a talk I, I gave a couple years ago for the first time at a major conference in, in Philadelphia. And I actually had an opportunity to give a copy of it to Pope Francis. I was in Rome and I had a, a, a CD of it and I gave it to him and he kind of looked quizzically at this, you know, and his, his English, they say, is not that good. And I was just making up words as I, I do. And I, I don't know if I was speaking Italian or Latin or what I said, uh, Theologia de Corpore Antique. You know, and he looks at me and I said, it's, you know, it's theology of the old body. It's about your, your body and my body. We both have old bodies. And he says, oh, he says, me, not you. So uh, <laughs> I've had an intimate conversation uh, with Pope Francis. And I, pretty soon this story will be all about me. It's not too, not too far in the, the future. But the story of Bam and Bad. Bam is, uh, refers to my mother. Uh, I took care of her for about off and on for five and a half years when she had uh, dementia. And I put these a lot of these stories up on uh, Facebook because it, it gave me some relief <laughs> from, from doing it. So I called her Bam, or the beloved aged mother. Uh, she was one of the best mothers you could ever have. This is a picture of her. She's on the far right hand side with her three, uh, with her two brothers and her parents. They were immigrants from uh, Slovenia, grew up in Cleveland. That's her high school graduating picture. That's when she was in college. Our wedding picture and my parents are uh, towards the end of his life. Um, so she's Bam in this story, and I'm bad. I'm um, I'm the beleaguered aging daughter. All right, and uh, this is my mother taking care of us when we were kids in our little little kitchen, feeding me breakfast and. I did always have the sense, I, I've never married and don't have children, I always had the sense that I hoped that someday I actually would be able to care for either both uh, one or, or both of my parents. I felt that it was important for me uh, to have a caretaking uh, experience. And it was uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life and one of the most wonderful things uh, I've ever done in my life. And uh, here's the two of us at a wedding rehearsal. Uh, you can see she looks lively and alert, and I look absolutely <laughs> like I'm <laughs> going out of my mind. And I, I was. I mean, that's that's absolutely right. Uh, there were. I did not do this by myself. I had a great deal of help uh, taking care of my mother. One is my my sister, who's on the right hand side, Pat, and uh, we called her too bad. Um, the other ornery, uh, beleaguered, aging daughter. <laughs> She would say that's true. I mean, she has no offense at that uh, at that title. So she took care of my mother about half a year, and I'd take the other half. And the last year and a half or so, I, I went to live with my mother. And then we had this marvelous uh, caretaker, Lynn. Uh, we called her Ba, the beloved aging helper. And what what I would say is that uh, one of the one of the wonderful parts of, of this work is meeting the caretakers. Uh, they are exceptional people. Uh, they have an, a capacity to love, and, and they have patience that is just, uh, to my mind, defies belief. Uh, that, 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 and she came to love my mother, and we all came uh, to love her. Now, there's a way in which my parents, this seems insulting, but I hope you'll, I, I adored my parents. I thought they were wonderful. But my parents were a little bit like uh, <laughs> these two. My my dad was one of Arthur, wait, 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 wait who, Tell me their names. Um, Archie and, and Edith Wright. My dad was extremely good at ranting and raving about anything. You know, he could he could give you a long discourse about the world. And um, we actually had a he actually had a son-in-law live with him for a period of time, and he just thought it was the funniest thing in the the world that they would watch reruns of this at night with his ne'er do well deadbeat uh, son-in-law. And. My, my mother was a very, very bright woman, uh, but had a kind of daffiness about her, you know, and you just kind of couldn't quite couldn't get, get it, quite why this really bright woman was often so, so daffy. So I've taught for some years now the theology of the body, John Paul II's uh, work on um, marriage and anthropology and sexuality. At the very end of that book, he talks about the theology of the body should be applied 
to more topics. He said the term theology of the body goes far beyond the content of the reflections presented here in his book. These reflections do not include many problems belonging with regard to their object to the theology of the body. Things such as the problem of suffering uh, and death, so important in the biblical message. You know, I'm on the threshold at least, if not more than beyond the threshold of old age myself. And I feel like I've, in, have, I've come into a new country where I don't know the language and the habits and what I'm capable of and not capable of. It's, just, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a startling thing. My mother would often say, I, I never thought I'd get this way. And I was, I've always been terribly sarcastic and said, well, how did you think you would get? But, but now I'm the same way. So like, I never knew that I'd get this way, whatever it is. So some of the themes are here is that really the body does express the person. And you can see something about who the person is on the interior um, because of the, the outside. And, and still a capacity of what John Paul II says the, bit the body shows is our capacity for giving to others. And... Uh, old age is a time when there's a lot of giving and receiving, uh, and it's a, an important time for people. Um, and that we're here on this face of the earth to love, to be loved, and to love. And I certainly found abundant opportunity uh, with my mother at the end of her life. And that was so important for her to know that she was surrounded by love. Because, you know, every old person thinks they're a burden and that's what they fear the most. And our job really is to convince them that they're not, all right? And as, as hard as it can be, and as demanding as it can be, um, they should, I mean, babies are a darn burden, aren't they? Teenagers are a burden. Uh, young adults are a burden. Uh, so you're thinking, it's, it's not true that only old people are a burden, but it's the, the ability to love them that is really the, the rich part of the reality. And the body is a gift and allows us to be a gift. And so that certain ability simply to be with my mother, physically to be with her. I just remember a couple of times, you know, she just she said, are you stay how long are you staying? And towards the end I said, I'm staying until there's no reason to stay. And she just would, I mean, that relief, that incredible relief that, you know, I'm gonna be here till the end, Mom, don't worry about that. I'm here. And just, you know, she just smile and you see peace just would would wash over her. Because many times she said, you know, obviously I can't take care of myself anymore. I can't. What would I do? What would I do without you? Well, there were six of us, and I always told her that she was smart to have six children because she got at least one good one out of the, out of, <laughs> out of the batch. <clears throat> there were other good ones, of course, but she always laughed at that. She always laughed at that. Um, a, a work I'm a little going to bit drawn here is John Paul II's um, book, uh, or encyclical, Salvifice Dolores. Uh, sort of save the, suffer the suffering that saves, right? Salvific suffering. And, you know, some of us are foolish enough to have had this idea that when we're young, you know, that you'll sort of get to be a certain age and retire, and then you just kind of coast, right? You just kind of coast. And then you find out everything that was easy at one time is hard now. You know, things, reading bills and paying bills, with registering for Medicare. You've got to be a genius to be able to, uh, to, to do that. And um, so you, you thought, okay, I've got everything in place. I've sort of got habits, my feelings, finances. This. And then it's just all you're sort of you're in this new mysterious world. So really, to, you don't want to think too much about old age as being a, a time of suffering. But it is, and and it's important to know that that's an important time, right? That suffering needs to be embraced in a sense and offered up. There's not a lot of our energies diminish, our ability to, to do things for people, but we can offer up our suffering. And most, most Catholics become much more prayerful as they enter into their old age because now you have the time and you've got a lot to pray for. Uh, and it's it's really incredibly valuable uh, for for people to have that prayer. So this is what John Paul II said. said he says, what we express by the word suffering seems to be particularly essential to the nature of man. It's as deep as man himself. Suffering seems to belong to man's transcendence. It is one of those points in which man is in a certain sense destined to go beyond himself. And he is called to this in a mysterious way. I also find it, it 
as you get older, allows you to even see the suffering that other people are having that you might not have seen before. Even with the young people who are yearning, they're filled with yearning. Yearning to find the right spouse and yearning to get the good job and yearning to do all these things and not to miss out. I don't have many yearnings anymore except, you know, to not fall over when I stand up. I mean, that's, you know, that, you, you diminish your yearnings. Uh, but to, to, in a sense, realize how many yearnings they still have and to pray for those and to recognize that you were sort of on the sidelines now cheering for a new generation and praying, praying for that generation. This is one of my favorite passages from the Velveteen Rabbit about getting real. He said, you become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But those things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. And, and that was one of the most beautiful things I have some pictures later, but the way that the great-grandchildren grandchildren and great-grandchildren adored my mother, right? They just adored her. And I just said, said they sensed love sitting over there in that corner. You know, you get close, you get up on her lap and everything, and get cuddled, and it's just, they saw that she was real. They saw what was important uh, there. And this one almost always made me, always made me cry, uh, written by an Alzheimer's patient. Do not ask me to remember don't try to make me understand. Let me rest and know you're with me. Kiss my cheek and hold my hand. I'm confused beyond your concept. I'm sad and sick and lost. All I know is that I need you to be with me at all cost. Do not lose your patience with me. Do not scold or curse or cry. I can't help the way I'm acting. I can't be different though I try. Just remember that I need you, that the best of me is gone. Please don't fail to stand beside me. Love me till my life is gone. And that's, I think that was so in my mother's heart. Just that, please be with me. Please love me, please, please be me here. I wasn't always patient, believe me. And I often contributed to her confusion by being so sarcastic. And afterwards, I think like, it was funny to me, but it wasn't really all that funny. <laughs> but she was patient. All, she was the patient one in the whole in, in, endeavor. So this is also from John Paul II's statement. He says, human suffering evokes compassion. It also evokes respect. And in its own way, it intimidates. For in suffering is contained the greatness of a specific mystery. When you start taking care of an, anyone, really, but in this case, your mother, you start to join a club. <laughs> you see these people everywhere. You say, I know those people. I know what she's going through. I know what they're doing. And it, there's really something so tender and, and beautiful uh, about it. Uh, the ability to be that person that's taking care um, of another person. And these are two uh, terrific books uh, out there. There's more and more because there's more and more people suffering these things. But learning to speak Alzheimer's, I found to be extremely helpful. This was actually a man who, who got Alzheimer's, a woman wrote it about her husband. He got Alzheimer's when he was 42, all right? And she was raising young children. And so taking care of young children and her husband. And the 36 hour day, okay, doesn't seem like 24, it seems like 36. Um, but again, lots of good advice. And then in this one, the best friends approach uh, to dementia care. And there's all sorts of great websites and organizations. And now they send, like, they'll send you a little email every day with an uplifting little message. And all, I found all of that helps. I'm going to tell you just some of the things you have to do, and then more importantly, but one is, is really establishing a, a safe environment. This one, you know, we have black and white tape on every step, and you look at your whole house differently. It's like you kid-proof a house, you know, your grandma a help house, because there's so much that their eyesight doesn't get, etc., and things that are perfectly safe otherwise, and you've got to do that. Another is to keep routine. Um, we had a long driveway with the uh, mailbox at the end, and just get around every day uh, to get out and go get the mail. And she would check the mail several times a day. And before long you realize not to say it hasn't come yet. You could say, go check, go check, 
You checked 20 minutes ago, but go check. You want to check? Go check. At check. Just something to do. And of course, anybody gets outside, it's a, it's a good deal. We did memory made aids. I found that um, wet boards are extremely useful. You like channels 705 and 702, and golf is on channel 733. I had a, because you get First of all, I mean, the person who discovers the cure, not for Alzheimer's and dementia, that'd be great, but the part of it which is incessant, repetitive questions, that's the one. That's the one that will drive you crazy. So every morning, you know, what day is this? What month is this? What are we doing today? So I had a big, you know, wet board, and you write all of this up there every day. And she asked the question, you point to the board. Some of that's easier than answering. But anyway, we, we started having these all over the, uh, all over the place. Now, the pain of memory loss. My mother, I'm going to tell you these anecdotes. She was always, again, a very smart woman. My dad was exceedingly funny. My mother was funny, too, but he was so funny, we didn't quite realize how funny she was until he was no longer there. And then all of a sudden, we're like, gosh, in the middle of her dementia, I mean, she could, uh, you could engage in a conversation with her. She can't remember what she had for lunch, if she had lunch. And she couldn't remember a lot, but she had these little Zingers. Boom, right? oh, she gets you. That's what she's called. Bam. So one day I'm having a conversation. I'm really losing my memory. Bad me says, even young people have trouble remembering things. They're doing very well for an 88 year old. Bam, I appreciate your insight, but I would rather be the self that remembers than a self that can't remember. So I said the other day, I was impressed that you noticed something that was removed from dad's grave. She remembered there was something missing. And she said, but I don't remember that I noticed it. Right? So we would have these conversations almost every night. What are we having for dinner tonight? Hamburgers. I can't remember the last time. Oh, sorry, this got Okay, for the eighth time in five minutes, she asked me, she says, what are we having for dinner tonight? Hamburgers. I can't remember the last time I had hamburgers. I said, well, you wouldn't have had hamburgers. Well, you could have had hamburgers for lunch and you wouldn't remember. Good one, she says. <laughs> she was always ahead of me. Uh, every once in a while, she wanted to go to a movie. My, my niece took her to see the movie The Artist. I don't know if you remember it, but it was a black and white movie that involved a lot of dancing. It was a silent movie, but it was a new movie. But, so um, I took her to the movie the second time. I said, Mom, would you like to go to a movie? She said, yes. She said, well, let's go again to this artist. You liked it last week. So I, after the movie, I said, did you like it? She says, not a bit. It was way out there. I like the dancing, but who needs to sit through all that just to see the dancing? Well, last time you saw it, you liked it. I never saw it before. Who, who said that? I would like to know who said that. I think Anna, your niece, took you. I want to talk with her. I want to know why she said that. I'm driving. I'm practically driving off the road while we're having this conversation. She says, we, I say, well, you know, you forget a lot. It is possible you saw it before and you forgot that you did. Well, I'm the first one to admit that. I hope I forget it this time. <laughs> okay. I hope I forget it this time. All right, so one day she's talking about, she would say these things. She says, the other night we're sitting on a couch and Bam announces, I have reached a new plateau. My memory is getting worse again. I respond, I'm amazed that you have such self-awareness and can register these things. She says, and I'll bet you're really impressed with my terminology too. <laughs> new plateau, all right? She would say these things that did show amazing self-awareness in the midst of this um, retreating in a certain sense into a world that um, you know, wasn't so in contact with this world. She would talk about feeling her sadness. She'd say, I'm feeling my sadness today. She would call a certain day a nostalgia day. I'm having a nostalgia day. She'd say a certain day was a day of adjustment. And she also talked about the mystery phase of her life. <laughs> I love these phrases. Well, one thing I found, my mother was um, almost fanatically neat. And I hate to say that I'm quite the opposite. I can live with a remarkable level of debris. And um, 
one day I was sorting out my stuff on the dining room table, took up the whole table, and she comes in. It's just like, oh my gosh, it was so hard for her. And I remember one day I, I just took a nap, and after I got up from my nap, I didn't smooth down my, my bed. And she comes up to me and she says, when did you decide it was no longer important for you to make your bed? Incredible. And then another day, same sort of thing. And she says, um, do you call that making your bed? I mean, the nieces and nephews talk about making my bed, beds with my mother as being torture. Because, it, I mean, she was honestly the kind of person, you pull, pull back the bed, the blanket at night, she slipped in, right? And in the morning, she slipped out, you know, and you put the, the, the bed up, and, but then you take 20 minutes to smooth. There's nothing to smooth. And then you, you measure everything to make certain that all the blankets are measured right, everything. It was all crazy, but for her, it was just her, uh, the way that she was. So one of the things I had to tell the nieces and nephews when they came is, don't leave anything anywhere that it's out of place. You've got a room in the back and take anything there and block, just shut the door so she doesn't see it. Because it was so stressful for her. And I think we have to remember that, that so much for the people who have dementia and Alzheimer's is they do have body memory. I mean, I couldn't ask my mother, say, go, go get your, uh, where are your socks or something? She couldn't say that. I said, go get your socks. And she could go get them. So you have to leave everything basically the way it is for them because that's what they know is their, their body remembers. Another very important thing are photo al albums. I, I made a photo album every year of the events of the last year. There was a year we had, this was the year of three weddings. But uh, it was something we could definitely do uh, a good part of every day was go through uh, photo albums. And even when people came to the house that didn't know quite how to interact with my mother anymore, you get out a photo album and go through that and it really, it really worked. She just totally loved that. So some of the nieces and nephews would make special albums for her. You also need to stay close to nature. I mean, a bird feeder is absolutely essential. And a chair near a window that can see the bird feeder is absolutely essential. And we lived out in the country, so we saw a wide variety of birds. We saw deer regularly. We saw oh, it's a raccoon and, of course, a giraffe now and then. <laughs> um, OK, this is someone else who wrote uh, on my Facebook page about staying with her grandmother. She said, my little 99-year-old Nana has dementia. I had a beautiful evening with her yesterday, where we both just sat in a little courtyard at her nursing home and enjoyed the evening together. For a moment, I think we both sensed that there was a sacred presence. And I couldn't help but say, it's nice just being here, isn't it, Nana? Yes, she said, very calm. And then we just sat for a little while, doing nothing. And that's something to learn to treasure, is just sitting outside and just enjoying sitting there. And the nieces and nephews were at first afraid of grandma because they didn't know how to interact. And I would say, just go first go right over to her and tell her how nice she looks. And she learned to say to that, we'd say, Grandma, you look so nice today. And she'd say, I can't help it. <laughs> say that. And, um, and then I said, tell her something about your day. Tell her about something about your day. And then pick up one of these picture books or something. And it changed the whole atmosphere. They were eager to get there and eager to be with her because they knew how to, how to interact. One thing is, is that, I mean, with dementia, again, it's sort of like moving backwards and more to a more childlike state. And so as, we, as she would do that, I would do the same things again you might do for a small child, and she would love it. One thing is she loved to go shopping, and I found this little yellow plastic container, and I, she loved cookies, so I put, would put cookies in it. And so when she would just sort of get a little bored, say, Mom, you've got something in your purse, she'd take it out, and this, I knew her every time, every time. And there was a cookie in it, you see? And that made life worth living, a, a surprise a surprise cookie. And I would buy little things for her. This is a little musical um, flower that you could hit something on the side and it would sing. Well, until she watered it, um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> we had some trouble with those things. Uh, we had fish uh, dumped down the drain because things were dirty, so she cleaned them. Um, I got her these little things from Africa, just little things you put around the house. They're new and she notices them, she loves them. After all, they don't have to be new, of course, because they're all new, but it's fun to have new things. And then I bought a car. I couldn't believe it. I bought a Mini Cooper, a yellow Mini Cooper. 
my family thought I was crazy, and I, su I suspect I was, but she always wanted a yellow car. And I thought, you know, I need a new car. I'm going to get a yellow car. And the only yellow car there was with four-wheel drive was either a Jeep or a Mini Cooper. So what do you got to get? But I never in my life thought I'd have a Mini Cooper, you know, but there, but there I did. And she loved it. Uh, it's, one of, it's like a dog or a child. It's a, um, it's a conversation starter. Wherever you drive and you fill up your Mini Cooper, people talk to you. It's, a, it's always a conversation thing. And I used to travel around with like two kayaks on the top of my car, and people just love this, the two old ladies in this car with the kayaks. <laughs> and and as, as she got older, I mean, she really did love stuffed animals. And one night she couldn't sleep when she got up in the middle of the night, and I just found all these. We had stuffed animals because we had um, great-grandchildren around. So I would get stuffed animals, and I would give them to her. And one night, one night you know, I told her, these are, these are all yours. You get to keep them. And she says, this is better than Christmas, better than Christmas. And there came a time where she really even did like those little toys where you punch a button and something pops up. That, that, that really served for you know, 10 minutes of amusement. Believe me, 10 minutes is 10 minutes. So one thing we did uh, not long after I started taking care of her, she certainly wasn't at the far end of things. She was sort of newly entering into this. And we had asked her um, what she, what, what, if she could do one final big thing, what, it, what would it be? And we have lots of relatives in, in Europe, so she wanted to take a trip to Europe. So that meant, meant going to France, several places in France, and then to uh, Slovenia, where she'd been several times. And uh, I, I think it was, uh, there was, it's, it's possible, possibly, it truly was uh, insane. Um, uh, as, as happened with almost any uh, trip, well, first we, we planned one, and my, she broke her wrist. So the doctor said we couldn't go. So I had everything planned, everything planned. So. We got the airlines. It was a bit of a bargain to get the tickets changed. And I, I went with one of my brothers and his 15-year-old son. And we took Grandma with us. Uh, we had this traveling Grandma. Um, you can see her there. We took her picture with her cane and her broken arm. And she joined us at various sites um, <laughs> around around Europe. So we, we had her just about everywhere. It was, it was, it was a good time. I had a great welcome home when she got home. So um, <laughs> she never understood those pictures. <laughs> we had a good time. Well, the next year we tried again. We didn't learn, all right? And um, the day, you can't quite see in this picture, but on the one side of her head you can see some red, well, those are big, big bruises. She, she fell. She had to get stitches in the top of her head. My sister was going to the emergency room on the way to the airport. Um, with my sister, with with my mother, and there was there's some big snags that when they got to we were going through Paris on the way to Slovenia, and um, they did a very bad job of transporting my mother from one plane to another, and they had a, they ended up missing their flight, had a six hour layover. Um, so this is us getting to Slovenia, and all my sister wanted was a stiff drink, and this is one of the cousins bringing my sister a stiff drink as she exits. Uh, I don't know how many she had on the plane, actually, but anyway, it was great. All the relatives got to see my mother. She got to see her her parents' ancestral home. Uh, this is her uh, one of her brothers married a French woman, and uh, he died many years ago, so she got to meet her again. So they had many many upsides, but I want to tell you, dementia is hard enough to deal with, with repetitive questions than when on your train. Why are on this train? Where are we going? How long will it will be? You know, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. Anyway, we did it. We did it. Old skills are the best things. All right. She always loved to dance. All right. So my mom and dad were great dancers. And so it, th this was the year of five weddings. She had so much fun. All the nephews and the brothers and everybody danced with her. And uh, every once in a while, um, I love that little one about people thinking of themselves dancing. She would do a little dance. I had a little music on this one. And um, it just made her so happy and the rest of us get some new skills. I don't know if you here know this game. What is it? Cornhole. Right. My mother had never played cornhole in her life. We have, my brother-in-law had one in his driveway and she comes up and he, she says, what are you doing? It says cornhole. So he gives her the, f the four um, pockets of corn, you know, the, that you throw to get in the hole. She made three out of four <coughs> in her first attempt, you know, and it's just, it, it's staggering. Um, she would get prizes for all these things, the senior Olympic first prizes for, 
for cornhole. Also, you know, keep it keep it pretty goofy. I went off to Africa and bought this hat and sent her a selfie, and I said, I miss you when I'm gone. And she says, I miss you too. Um, you are so full of it. Um, <laughs> And then one time she said to me after I'd done something, I wish your father were alive. Maybe he could help me understand you. <laughs> you say, and I do think he was qualified um, uh, to do that. So again, she loved, she, uh, yeah, she had this leopard coat and uh, it was greatly vied after by the granddaughters um, when she died. She just, my father wouldn't go anywhere. Uh, with her when she was wearing it, but but she loved it. And one of her daughters is a clown, so my mother participates fully. And this was one of the Christmas parties we were at. Now, of course, there's all sorts of vulnerabilities that um, the aging aged have, and I, I I wasn't as sensitive as I would have liked to have been to those. Again, I'm a little sarcastic, but this is a beautiful some beautiful biblical passages. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Said, amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And it's very important for us to understand that there's, there's wisdom in scripture for every state of life and how close we get to Jesus at this point where you're very helpless. Uh, have to be taken down off the cross. Well, very early on, when we were all just sort of gathering and starting to take care of Mother, we're sit she's sitting on a bench at the front of the house, and everybody's there having a great time, but she, she says, she just observes, she says, I've lost my independence. I can't do anything by myself anymore. Someone is watching over me all the time. I know it's for my own good. I love you dearly, but I can have an attitude if I want to. <laughs> which she did on occasion, okay? So mornings, she'd come out and say, I'm really worried about myself. And I'd say, why is that? She says, I've lost my memory. I just can't remember anything. My memory used to be so good. And I said, don't worry about it. I will remember whatever it is that you need to know. She says, do other women go through this? Did my mother go through this? I don't remember her going through this. I never thought I would get like this. And then I'd say, your mother did go through this. A lot of women do. I'm so grateful uh, that you're with me. What would I do without you? I'm so blessed to have children. What do other women do who don't have daughters? And I'd say, God takes care of people in different ways. So she was very aware, very aware of being needy, very aware of being cared for, and concerned about others. What, what about others? Okay. So again, from scripture, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you, and I will bear you, and I will deliver you. Now that's all very sweet, but I wasn't always very sweet, so I had alternate answers to some of her questions. She said, I've lost my memory, I just can't remember anything. My memory used to be so good. I'd say, I think that's a false memory. <laughs> She'd say, do other women go through this? A hundred times. After you get here at a hundred times, it's really hard to be sweet and kind. So I'd say, no, you're the only one ever. That's why we're watching you so closely. All right, other mornings, she sashays into the living room full of smiles and giggles and says, I'm so happy. I say, why are you so happy? I don't know. I'm just so blessed. Because those are beautiful times, right? Now, shopping with my mother had so many dimensions to it. Again, it, it, there were phases. Um, the first phase was she didn't like it that I was choosing what to buy in the grocery store. She said, why are you deciding what to get? I'm the mother. I should be deciding what we need, right? She didn't like it. I'd say, I'm, I'm gonna, I know what we're going to make for dinner tonight. I'll go, no, 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 I'm the mother. Phase two was this is all so overwhelming. Right? There's just so much to do here. Phase three was, is this is also fascinating. She'd pick up everything. What is this? I've never seen this before. What do they use this for? Just go around the store. It's like a new place. And then she would buy things she'd never seen. She says she's never seen before. And then we get to the checkout. She's so upset that there's so many strange things in her cart. Who put this here? Why are we getting this? We don't need this. Mommy, you put it in. I wouldn't do that. Who put this here? 
And phase four was, I'll just sit in the car. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. I couldn't do this by myself. But there were these, these, these phases. Um, she had bossy children, my brothers and sisters. No, me, sometimes, okay. Beleaguered aging daughter was bossing beloved aged mother around. Bad ass bam. I asked my mother, do you mind it if I'm so bossy? I have two friends here. They're going to know what she said. I expect it. That's what she said. <laughs> Jeez. She always had my number, all right? Of course, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of disorientation. Um, of one time, we were going to a, 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 the first wedding of one of the, the um, grandchildren, and all the way there, you know, where are we going? Going to Rochester, New York. Why? Carrie's getting married. Who's Carrie? Carrie's daughter. I actually, well, I think I'll say this, but I actually wrote everything down. She was so logical. She asked all the questions in exactly the same order. So being, I suppose, nasty. I didn't know I was being nasty, but I guess it was. I mean, I wrote them out, and she'd ask me questions. I'd say, it's on the list. Which, oh, we're going to Rochester. Why are we going to Rochester? It's on the list. Number two. Carrie's getting married. Okay, three hours. Three hours of this. All right. After the wedding, after the wedding, my mother walks up to the, after a long and beautiful wedding ceremony, Bam approached the mother of the groom and said, the person who died must have been very popular. I've never seen so many people at a funeral. All right. For years, the only thing she's been to were funerals, all right? So any big church event is, is a funeral. Uh, that made the rounds so quick at the reception, you, you can't imagine. Uh, one time, one of my priest friends came to visit me in Pennsylvania. It was so nice, where, to, where I was caring for. And a nice priest. So he, he, makes, he uh, does the dishes after dinner. This was totally tra traumatic for my mother. Yikes, a priest doing dishes? I mean, that was never in her, her growing, her, my father, my father, she said, my great, my grandfather, he couldn't have handled this. He couldn't have, couldn't have handled a priest doing bishops, just beneath, beneath the priest. So these different things you learn, like, whoa, that's very offensive. Of course, this incredible desire to be productive. She, I, she loved ironing. She always loved ironing. We started taking in ironing, right? We asked people, please drop by your ironing, all right? <laughs> We, we need to iron. And she loved um, sweeping leaves. I had buckets of leaves that I would throw on the driveway, you know, uh, to help to give her something to do. We started making these Thai fleece blankets, right? They're very easy to do. You just took two pieces of fleece and you cut the edges and you tie them. And I thought this, she'd love doing this, be very, something she could do. Well, the first night I spent all this time setting it up for her, helping her do it. And I think it's going to take days now. And I give her one of these to do. And, and she's done about, you know, a couple, a row or something. And I said, Mom, it's bedtime. And she said, no, I can't go to bed. I say, why not? She says, this has got to get done. I can't go to bed until this is done. You know, so hours, you're watching her, you know, and you're thinking there's my whole, I thought this was going to be for the whole week I'd have something for her to do. So one day, all right, one day we're doing this, we're cutting these blankets. And she, she asked me, why she makes, why are we making so many blankets? I said, well, I said, you're retired. And retired people have hobbies, and this is a hobby for you. And Bad gives Bam many examples. I tell her many examples of relatives who are tired and have hobbies that they work on every day. And she states, she tells me, my mom says, I don't think of myself as retired. And I said, well, what do you think of yourself as? And she says, well, I've just entered another field. And I said, well, what field might that be? And she says, the field of helping you with your projects. It's incredible. One thing you do at the end is you divest of things. You you give things away. And these were she had she had enough um, uh, Christmas stockings for every grandchild. So one day, one Christmas we we gave all those away. Then of course she always she wants you to do that. Give them away. And then the next Christmas, where are they? You know. And we love this sort of thing. A plastic uh, plastic rain bonnets. You know, you just little labels all over the house. What are you going to do with all the plastic rain bonnets? And for her, it's like. Uh, Mom, nobody wants them. We need to just give them to salvation. But you sure Pat doesn't want them? Yeah, I'm sure Pat doesn't want them. Have you called her? 
no, mom, I, I know. I mean, I know if I called her, she'd say no. So you're trying to honor her by, by going through this stuff with her. On the other hand, it was just, it was insane. Um, again, everything is kind of an enhanced interrogation. You know, you, I believe now I could be tortured and would not reveal any secret. I, I think, <laughs> again, it's like Groundhog Day. If you remember Groundhog Day, every day is just like every, every other day. And every morning, uh, I, she had to take a few pills, not that many. But there was the one thing she balked at was taking pills, you know. And mom, um, you know, you have to take these pills. All of them? Yes, mom, all of them. All of them? Yes, mom. Oh, just, why don't you, no, not all of them, mom. Just the pretty ones. Just eat, take the pretty ones, you know, and she looks at me. And we had all sorts of things, you know. Um, in the, in, until, until the very end, I realized I'd take some pills. And why I didn't every day just take mine with her, it would have done a lot of good. But you usually have the recognitions of how things would have been better about three weeks after it w it's useful, right? Everywhere you go, trees, trees fascinating. There are trees, there's trees everywhere. Yeah, there are, Mom. Trees everywhere, Mom. Um, yeah, and they didn't, nobody planted them. They all came up by themselves. They did. God did this. God planted these. Now, that's pretty thought, but you hear it 20 times in three miles, you will want to jump out the window. <laughs> same, same thing with, um, she, for some reason, she loved the lights on cars. And it was always, look at those lights. Aren't those interesting lights? Everyone should go, no, Mom, they're not interesting. They're not in the least bit interesting. You know, wait, wait, wait. No, no meltdowns here, no meltdowns, all right? Life as a scavenger hunt. Those of you who have taken care of people with dementia. This is a typical day with me looking for something in the kitchen. Where did Mom put it? All right, this is my sister guarding her sink so my mother doesn't get, get near it. And there's phases there, too, that first she puts things where they could go but don't. Right? It could go under the sink or it could go over there. And you say you think for me, you say, well, they always go over here, but let me check over here. And they're, they're there. Then you put things where there are other things that look somewhat similar. I'll show you some pictures. You put things anywhere they fit. That's the third one. So one day I find the M&Ms in the coffee pot because that kind of looks like a candy jar when you think about it. I find leftover bread in the coffee maker. Because you see the white and the plastic, that looks like a, you know, a, a, a filter. And one day I found a pan underneath the, the coffee maker was a great spot for her to put things where she didn't know she went. One day, one day I'm making cookies. She's standing by me watching making cookies and I'm doing all this stuff and then time for the eggs. And I go here and there's, the eggs aren't there. I said, Mom, oh, there were eggs, right? There was a carton of eggs right here. Where, where's that carton of eggs? She says, I didn't see any carton of eggs. I said, Mom, there's a carton of eggs right here. I'm making cookies. I have to have the eggs. No, I, not me. I didn't, I didn't touch the eggs. So I gave up. I looked where I thought they'd be. Well, um, <laughs> turns out they were in the, the freezer because it looks like a lot of like an ice cube tray, right? So much like an ice cube tray, the next time you need ice cubes, you get eggs <laughs> in, your, in your water. Right? This was a con constant problem was her walker. We had a big, big uh, one-story home, and her bedroom was at one end, and sort of the storage stuff was at the other end. And no matter, your know, mom, you have to use the walker for walking. Well, we need to put it away. I said, Mom, no, the walker needs to be wherever you are because you're going to be using it when you get up. But it needs to be put away. So every time I'd look, she'd wheel it way to the back of the house and leave it there. And then stagger to wherever she was, you know. And then she wanted to get up and she said, I need my walker. I said, I know it should be right there beside you. Well, I put it away because she always puts things away. This, this, I mean, if anything was going to, there are a couple things. This was one of them that I just about needed a, a straight jacket to take, take me out. So these are my most common thoughts. Where is X? That's noon on Monday. I can't find X. And on two Thursdays, oh, that's where it is. <laughs> Four days later. Now this is a strange one. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but my mother's underwear and I, I have to say it, they're pretty much alike. So after we do laundry, I'm sorting underwear. And she, she immediately starts, after I'm done, she puts everything together. She's among the stacks, they were there for a reason. So I start marking. You see the M up there with a sharpie. That means mom. And then the next time she folds them, she makes sure the M can't be seen. You know, so I put another M on. I think I ended up with five M's on the, the you know, of course everybody said, why don't you buy all her pink and you white? Well, that's what we ended up doing. But it was just, it was this 
contest to could I get them folded before she re reordered the, the whole thing. So some of the possible titles for this talk that aren't all my inventions that people listening to it. One is euthanasia. <laughs> Why not? That would be for me, for me, all right? Institutionalization, why not? Again, for, for me, all right? Um, getting out of the house was torture as well. I mean, as you know, a woman's purse is the most important thing in the world. And we spent an enormous amount of time looking for purses. And it, it, we just, she'd, sort of, she'd go through the house and just try to find, and I used to, I used to be very uh, frustrated trying to get to Mass, and I kept leaving more and more time before to get Mass, so we get there in time, and then I gave up because there was always something to go back in the house and look for. Now, some people go through personality changes. My mother did not. She really was, these sound like she has a biting, biting part of her personality, but she really didn't. She was the sweetest person. And some people I've talked to or their parents really underwent a, a, a terrible um, transformation. Some extent, I think, you know, it's your, your filters uh, fall and whatever you've been hiding your whole life comes forward. Other times it's a chemical change in your brain. So you can't help it. I'm really concerned about when my filters fall. <laughs> my mother did not have a mean bone in her body. I have a lot of mean bones and I, how I'm when, when I, how bad I am when I have my filters, what it's going to be like when the filters fall. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be around um, to see it. But this one young man wrote again on my Facebook page, it's really beautiful. He says, I've been going through this with my dad for several years and there's been much grace. He ended decades of being insulting to me and became appreciative. He went the other way. I spent a lot of time sitting next to him with my arm around his shoulders or rubbing my hand across his back. When we are together, I'm usually touching him. We have come to a place where kindness and love are all that matter, and they can be demonstrated in very simple ways. My dad has never been religious, but he has come to enjoy it very much. When I pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet aloud or recite from my breviary, he has even begun to join in the parts of the Lord's Prayer that he remembers. Unexpected graces abound as we travel the road Leonard Cohen describes on his new record, I'm going home tomorrow, going home without my sorrow, going home without this costume that I wore. It's a beautiful story of one who went the other way from being mean to being loving. My mother was always much more concerned about her children than about herself. She's the kind of person that would wear the same bathing suit for 15 years because she couldn't afford one new one for herself, but could afford new ones for her growing, growing children. But as she got old, she got much more concerned about her parents. Look how look when she was 80, she dieted back to her wedding um, weight. But then as she got older, I mean, she she wanted to um, she wanted to watch her weight, but again, she couldn't remember what she ate. And so one day she's eating there and she asked me for another piece of toast. And I said, Mom, you've already had three pieces of toast and I, I don't know that you really want one. So I made her, uh, and so then she said, she said, when I get hungry, she said, I, um, she said, I don't, I don't think about that when I want toast. Yeah, who's gonna die a woman toast, all right? So I made her this tiny piece of toast. And she just sat there and looked at it and she says, God, please help get me through this day. <laughs> so one, one day we're going to a daily mass and um, as we're leaving, she won't leave. She just asks these questions, mom, what, what can't we go? She said, well, am I, am I dressed well enough for daily mass? And she always dressed nice. Said, mom, you're dressed very nice. It'd be the best dress there. She said, but really, am I, am I dressed well enough for daily mass? Yes, you are, mom, over and over. Then I realized I'm wearing a shirt that has some sparkles on it. And I said, mom, would it help if I changed? And she said, yes. All right, because she thought with my sparkles it meant I was better dressed than she was. And this wasn't right that the daughter be better dressed than the mother. So I went and changed, I went and changed my shirt. All right. One day she had small bruises on her arm. She bruises easily, though she doesn't feel never felt much pain. During the day she repeatedly shows them to me and bemoans that her arms look so bad. Bad, fatigued with her usual response, it's just old age, don't worry, it doesn't look bad. I asked, do they hurt? And she said, no. And she said, and I said, well, then don't mention them so often. And, <laughs> um, and she shot back, a little sympathy from you wouldn't hurt. All right? 
wherever she went, she was worse. She was worse than your. I don't know what age kids do this, four or five, but she always commented on people's appearance. It would just drive me crazy. I hope they didn't hear it in the grocery store. Does that woman know what she looks like? Oh, all this stuff. So you're just kind of nervous wherever you're, she, one day she's fascinated with dyed hair, tattoos, piercings, obesity, and never fails to inquire. Do you see that person with X, Y, and Z? Why does she dye her hair that color? And I, you know, I, she does it to entertain you. <laughs> And my mother says, well, she doesn't entertain me. She mystifies me. Uh, after a while, we couldn't, the, the nephews wouldn't go shopping with her because she would just pick up anything. Would you buy this? <laughs> would you wear that? And she would ask strangers standing there. She'd show, would you wear these shoes? Do you know anybody that would wear these shoes? Uh, and so this was constant. All right, constant. Um, watching TV was always an, an adventure. She's confused a lot by what she sees on TV. So of course, beleaguered aging daughter gets a lot of questions. Some of them make a bad laugh, made me laugh. She says, would you drink green coffee? Yeah, no. Right? All right, green coffee. You didn't get that. Anyway, looking at magazines, she'll look at, she'll show you this picture like Michelangelo with that woman, or Michelangelo's David. Who wants to look at that? Who wants to look at that? Who would put that in the paper? And one day she's looking, at, she asks my niece, what's your reason? I'm reading a story about hidden lives. And my mother says, well, I need a hidden life. And my niece says, what, what kind of a hidden life do you live? She says, well, it wouldn't be hidden if I told you, would it? <laughs> so one of our great, one of our great adventures was hospital stays. Uh, my mother had repeated little mini strokes and fainted, and we always, after a while we didn't, but for well, the first 20, we took her to the hospital. Again, this, this phrase is important. In my flesh, I compete was, complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Again, any physical suffering is sharing in Christ's suffering. But again, in the hospital, she never knew why she was there. So we put on the, the wet board, you fell yesterday. You blocked out. You are here for tests. <laughs> because how many times can you answer these questions? She didn't know why she was there. Now one day she's there, and my sisters and I are there. Well, three of the three daughters are there, and we're talking. And she's just asking us so many questions. Again, mom, I, I say, mom, I think you need a little a little rest. Why don't you shut your eyes and just take a little rest? So she did that. She her, immediately her head went down. And I'm like, Mom, wait, Mom, wait, Mom, you can't be sleeping that fast. Mom, what are, are you okay, Mom? And pat her and say, maybe you need to get our doctor. I think something happened. And then she opens one eye and says, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. All right, now, you are always looking for things, always looking for things to, to amuse, amuse her and sort of short circuit the, the questions. And a major thing really was prayer. Prayer was incredibly uh, valuable. And one day I was going to confession. Of course, I took her everywhere with me. I said, Mom, I'm going to confession. Would you like to come uh, to confession? And she says, well, I think I just recently went, which of course she didn't. And I, every Catholic says that, right? <laughs> it's a habit. It's a habit that you do. And I said, no. And she, and she said, well, I really, I really don't know what I would confess. I mean, my husband's been dead for years now. <laughs> my, my seminarians did not laugh at that one, and I said, oh, are you young? What you don't know if you don't know how funny that is. <laughs> so I said to her, well, Mom, you know, sometimes you're, you're not always as patient with your daughters as you should be. You're, you're exceedingly patient with, impatient with your daughters. And she said, but never excessively so. <laughs> uh, never, no, never intentionally so. Never intentionally, just right back at me. Never intentionally so. One of the most wonderful things we did was uh, go to Eucharistic Adoration, which she did not have a habit of doing. And um, I would take her there and I would give her something, maybe if she could read it to, at the times when she could still read. And she wouldn't. She would sit there in just this rapt attention uh, with the Eucharist. And one time I'm, I'm walking out and I, you know, I say, Mom, um, what did you and God talk about? And she said, he told me I still have a purpose on this earth. And you're thinking, whoa, I mean, that's exactly the thing she most needed to hear. And somehow that's what she heard. 
Um, the rosary is an absolute sanity saver. Again, if, if, if there's repetition going on, let's say just let's say the rosary. Let's say the rosary. And I remember visiting a friend of mine who had early onset Alzheimer's, and she was really very out of it. And um, I didn't get to see her often, but I went and I would say the rosary with her. And when I say the rosary with her, she said it every day of her life, and big smile, and just back and forth. And, and the doctor came over and said, what are you doing? We haven't seen her this responsive for months and months. And I said, I'm saying the rosary. I said, it's deep in her being. Um, she knows the rhythm. The sounds are right to her. So say the rosary. Another thing is to sing. Sing as many songs as you, you can. Uh, religious songs are great. Get yourself a hymnal. Steal one from the church. It's okay. <laughs> you can put it back later. But, um, you know, and also, I mean, everything's on the internet. Everything's on YouTube. Uh, put it, the internet was great in a sense. I, we would watch a lot of old band uh, orchestras playing band music, and she would love that. And you just sort of go from Dean Martin to Frank Sinatra, etc. You can spend quite a bit of time doing that. Have a great grandchild. Right? Oh my gosh. This is the sort of thing you'd see. They adored each other, you know. They're rolling their little vehicles around. Uh, they would just eat together. If Grandma had corn, he had corn, and they'd sit and watch TV. Um, this is in a hospital bed once. Just, just having a great time. And the grandchildren learn from Grandma. This is Grandma opening a Christmas present. And as those of you who had family members who were children of the depression, you know you you open everything up and you don't rip anything and you take off the paper. My mother would actually iron the paper, all right, <laughs> and fold it for another time. So this is grandma opening a present and these are the grandchildren <laughs> watching her open a present. It was hilarious. It's just like, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> But then again, the hugs from the grandchildren, they loved her and she, she loved them. All right, just a few. Mom, say the darndest things, going with the flow. One day she says, I hope I get it together. I said, I think it's time to let go of that goal. You just need to go with the flow. She says, ah, you're my flow. All right. At breakfast, she always asked whether she had finished reading the paper or get dressed first every day. One day when Bad told her she could do whatever she wants, she says, I'll read the paper. I get dressed more easily when I'm well informed. <laughs> My sarcasm sometimes backfired. One day she noticed that the washing machine and dryer were running and asked me what was in them. Uh, uncharacteristically lapsing into sarcasm, I say, newspaper. So Bam turns to her friend Lynn and says, I wonder what, no wonder I'm confused so often. Moments later, she says to Lynn, sotto voce, I need someone who is more stable to take care of me. <laughs> One day I, I take her for ice cream and she always liked a waffle cone, but she only wanted one scoop of ice cream. And this day they didn't have any small cones, so that the, the, um, the, the, the clerk was being very nice and gave her a big cone with just one little thing of ice cream in it. Of course, she looks at it and she says, this is dumb, 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 dumb. Such a small scoop of ice cream and such a big cone. About you know, five times I explained this to her. After about 10 minutes later, that's, I say to her, after she's saying, why do they're such a big cone? I said, you know, a lot of people don't finish those cones. They throw out what they don't eat, all right? Um, she's never thrown out anything, so this doesn't, this is not going to make any sense to her. But she says, turns to me, she says, how could you possibly know that? <laughs> and then she turns to her grandson, Clark, and says to him, you ask her a question. My mother says, so she asks her a question, she gives you an answer but you have no idea if it's true or not. <laughs> the question is, again, are, are we being had? Did she have our number the whole time? I mean, what's going on here? She's, Lynn, her caretaker, says to her, you can't go 10 minutes without asking a question. After 10 minutes of conversation, Bam said, it's been 10 minutes. I've asked only eight questions. Ooh, should have been 10 in 10 minutes. She's all, she's, I said, one time I said to my sister, can you take mom Friday night? I've been invited out. Bam says, what are you two talking about? I said, we're fighting over who gets to do the pleasure of your company Friday night. She says, I wish you would be more honest. <laughs> <laughs> 
Nightly, Bam says, did you say you want ice cubes in your water? Nightly, I say, I do. Bam says, I knew that. I said, why did you ask again if you already knew the answer? Hmm, I do that often, she says. <laughs> All right, so what did I learn? I learned the importance of affirmation, trying as much as possible to you know, tell her we loved her, still learning things from her, happy to have her around, uh, still important to be around. The unimportance of efficiency, the unimportance of finishing anything in a reasonable amount of time or getting any out of the door in a reason, forget it, just forget it, it's not important. Take advantage of nature, God provides entertainment. Patience, patience, patience. Uh, how to live <laughs> on the edge of insanity, which I think I was sometimes. The importance of breaks. I did get a, a full day off every week. I got in my car and I drove an hour away uh, to just somewhere and had a day of sleeping and reading and walking and it was very refreshing. And remember that human dignity uh, remains uh, always. Um, this story is going to, this is a sad one, but look at this lady and anybody looks like that and we sort of say, I never want to, I never want to be in that state. And I think, you know, we feed roses, don't we? Are those roses really more important than grandma, right? Spend a lot of time on that. We treasure items, a Mickey Mantle baseball. I might pay a million dollars for it. Get a very expensive case to put it in and make it protective. Isn't grandma worth at least that? Don't we love her at least as much as we love a Mickey Mantle ball? So instead of seeing that, you see this. Someone that has given love and is surrounded by love. And this was, I found this on a web page. A man had posted it um, the day after his mother died. He said, this photo picture shows mom who suffered from advanced multi-infarct dementia shortly before she died. We were under a big tree in the backyard where she could be part of and watch her grandchildren. I would hold her hand or knee for almost the whole time when the wheelchair bus brought her for her weekly visits. Dementia hadn't stopped her being a valuable member of the family, nor had the dementia let, lessened our love for her. And he wrote, my mom just died and I don't want to go to sleep because it means I will be waking up without her in my life tomorrow, while today she was alive and is still part of today. Right. Um, yeah, when my mother at the end, I mean, it was a lot of years, not as many as many, many people, 15, 20 years, you know, we didn't know that many. But at the end, you know, I see her, she can't do, she's in bed, she can't do much, she's in pain off and on, and thinking, you know, if if, um, if I could make the choice, it seems like now would be a good time, right? And then five minutes later, it's like, if I could keep her for another 24 hours, that's what I want. And then I said, I'm so glad I don't have to make the decision. I would have no idea what decision to make. It's not mine to make. God will keep her here as long as he wants her here, and he will take her when he wants her to go. And if I had to decide, I wouldn't have a clue how uh, to decide. There's these promises from Scripture that are so beautiful. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's in First Timothy. It also in 1 Timothy. That's my mother's mother, and that's my mother taking care of her mother. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So, I did it. Why? Because it's just. I owed it to my mother. I owed her a debt of love, and I did it to honor her. And you begin to see your mother or your loved one as a kind of a tabernacle. The divine is there. The divine is there. There they are with the divine. And so, um, and I got so much gratitude from her. First thing in the morning after grace, last thing at night, all day long, Bam tells Bad how wonderful I am. She always says how wonderful all her children are. It goes to show you she did have dementia. The surest sign that the surest sign that her dementia is serious is that she calls she tells people that none of her children ever caused her any trouble, or she's become a pathological liar. Um, she is such an extraordinary person from whom I learned a lot. So when I I'd have to apologize a lot almost every day. So when I apologize for my impatience and even meanness, my mother would say, um, "I really feel bad for you that you have to put up with this." referring to herself, being sympathetic to me. 
Or she'd say, don't you talk about my daughter that way. Or she'd say, nothing you do could offend me. Right? I'm sorry if I offended, nothing you do could offend me. But every once in a while, <laughs> she would, um, oh no, this is a beautiful one, what I need to hear. One day I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so off of crabby. And she says, who cares about crabby, right? It's always this way. So this is what I learned about being by a deathbed. Uh, her daughters were all there and one of her sons uh, was there. And during the time that she's dying, she spent two months in a hospice, which was a beautiful, beautiful place to, with gorgeous people taking care of her. Tell her about yourself and family members. Just keep talking, keep talking. Tell her about God and death and heaven and meeting loved ones there. Pray the rosary aloud and state specific intentions, among them that she'll have a happy death. Tell her about Jesus and why he came and what he did. Read portions of scripture, such as the Beatitudes. Mention we should all be sorry for our sins and that Jesus came to save them, to forgive them. Sing hymns. Oh, I sang You Are My Sunshine so many times, all right? Favorite old songs, that's not a hymn. Listen to music of her generation. Hold her hand, caress her brow, kiss her cheek. Tell her you love her and love being with her. Don't watch TV and leave your, leave your electronics aside. Just sit there. Sing, talk, sleep, I think is better than watching TV or spacing out on your social media. Not long, before, well, not long before she died, Bam had a long night of talking aloud and was very tired. <laughs> just before I go on, just remembering when I read today that she said, she said, one day she said, I haven't had a good night's sleep all day today. <laughs> that was like, sort of like Yogi Berra, right? So this was one time she talked all night long. She, I facetiously asked her if she was so tired because she was out dancing. She didn't respond. I said, well, maybe you dream, were dreaming of dancing? She laughed and said, no. And I said, what did you dream of? And she said, Jesus. Right? So I, I actually have 159 slides, um, but I'm not going to show you all of them. <laughs> I'm stop there. Uh, it was, um, as you can tell, it was hard, but unbelievably wonderful. And it was one of the most uh, challenging times of my life, but also one of the most uh, rewarding uh, to take care of my mother. So I think a lot of it is that we have to step back. It's gonna, it's a hard time, but it's going to be temporary by its very nature. And to um, see how loving we actually can be uh, to a person who has probably been unbelievably loving to us. And even if not, to show that person love at that end, as, as the one man said, his, his father became loving. All right, thank you for your patience. Thanks very much.